91. That's the number of people that die every day from opioid drug overdoses as reported by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention in 2017. And the fact that since 2000, more than half a million people have died from drug overdoses, mainly stemming from opioid use highlights, what the media has coined the opioid epidemic. Currently, we exist in the third wave of the opioid crisis, and the deadliest one at that as overdoses caused solely by opioids are the leading cause of death for Americans under 50 years old. While the first wave of the opioid epidemic was defined by the overprescription of painkillers such as oxycodone and hydrocodone, and the second wave was defined by heroin abuse, the current wave we live in attributes to drugs such as oxycontin and fentanyl. All the drugs previously mentioned have the same effect on the brain, shutting off pain receptors for the user's benefit. However, the harm of the opioids arise when addicted to its effects. The user abuses it, most often leading to a sudden death due from overdose. In fact, according to the New York Times, roughly 64,000 died from overdose in 2016, more than car accidents or gun violence, and in doing so at a rate faster than the HIV slash AIDS epidemic at its peak. Although the drug companies and doctors are key players in the escalation of the epidemic, it is important to acknowledge the insurers who are making it easier to access opioids rather than the alternatives, as well as the prisons with the lack of treatment options for imprisoned drug abusers. To properly pinpoint the origin of the opioid epidemic, let's travel back to the 1800s. Back then, the opioid epidemic was as present as it is today, albeit in a different form. Morphine taken via a hypodermic needle was the drug of choice and was prescribed carelessly by doctors looking to make a buck. The first generations of junkies, similar to opioid addicts of today, sought medication for pain, whether it be mental stress or physical discomfort. The parallels between then and now continued as the patient slowly became more desperate for the drug simply to return to the state of normalcy and without the much needed attention of the medical community. These victims slowly but surely overdosed, usually alone in their own homes on a drug that was pitched to them as beneficial. When the epidemic peaked during the Civil War, as more and more people were subjected to morphine use, the government responded with the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, the Anti-Narcotic Act of 1914, and the Heroin Act of 1924. But similar to government intervention today, legislation rarely breaks the tradition of opioid overdose, since addicts often turn to everything from street dealers to black markets and foreign imports. In order to understand why the opioid epidemic is so difficult to confront, you have to first understand the questionable workings behind the scenes of the large corporations who supply opioid drugs. Let's take the major company, Purdue Pharma, the company behind a prominent drug OxyContin, for example. Despite the massive health crisis surrounding OxyContin, Purdue Pharma has a history of sweeping controversy under the rug. In fact, to this day, Purdue Pharma is drenched in a storm of lawsuits from the families of overdose victims. In 1996, a copy of Confidential Justice Department report describes that Purdue Pharma knew about significant abuse of OxyContin when the drug was first introduced to consumers. In 1997, Purdue Pharma gains information that OxyContin has gained popularity online as well as gaining increased reports of abuse, addiction, and crimes. In 1999, Purdue Pharma's general Howard R. Adele writes a memo describing OxyContin as the hottest thing on the street, forget Vicodin. Jump to 2006 and the Purdue Pharma's offices are flooded with reports and complaints about the drug's harmful nature. Purdue Pharma continues to market OxyContin as less prone to abuse and addiction than alternatives. One year later, Justice Department officials indict Purdue Pharma, but after a company promised reparations for family victims as well as the removal of top officials, the government decided to meagerly settle the case. Today, Purdue Pharma and other similar companies continue its practices of false and aggressive marketing with often little or no government intervention. The wealth and influence of large pharmaceutical corporations rarely gives the incentive for policymakers to confront them. What can we do to stop the opioid crisis? Step 1. Hold doctors accountable through fines and possible jail time. We can give doctors a chance to carefully consider the repercussions before carelessly prescribing medications. Step 2. Implement plans. Certain health plans can employ professionals who can secure the safety of patients and future drug users through research, education, monitoring, and most importantly, making sure the right amount of drugs are given out. While fighting against the opioid epidemic, however, it is important for our policymakers not to scapegoat particular groups of people as the source of the issue, but rather to tackle the issue from an objective point of view. It is also important not to downright condemn opioids or all drugs in general as most drugs are still inherently beneficial, but to address its addictive qualities and how to prevent it from consuming a user's life. 
Thank you for watching today's Cure for Conflict. Be sure to follow us at the social media links provided and check out our other videos. See you next time.